This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everybody. I am uh, Dr. Mosman here at Laureate in Tulsa. I'm doing a webinar today for you to watch at some point in the future, should when you wish to. Um, and the topic I'm talking about today um, has to do with obviously the the passion that I come through here at Laureate. So this is about you know doing research in neurobiology. This is about being a board certified child adolescent psychiatrist who does medication management in both eating disorder and non eating disorder patient in my outpatient practice, um, and then sort of tying it all in. Um, obviously, with eating disorders and how those things interact. Um, you know, certainly it's one of those difficult things where eating disorders really travel alone, and then trying to treat them, depending on nutrition and age and those kinds of things, can, can be pretty complicated. Um, sometimes the data is limited, so we're going to at least go into what we know today. So yeah, we'll talk about psychopathology, how those illnesses work in these populations. Um, that always comes with neurobiology, and we'll talk about how we treat them medicine-wise and be specific about how that's maybe different in people with eating disorders. So we'll talk about brain development across the life cycle. Um, obviously a fascinating process. I have three kids of my own um, at home and to watch sort of that process of how the different uh, things work, abstractability, ability to, you know, have a frontal lobe, put on the brakes, et cetera, um, as we develop all the way up into our early 30s probably. Understand the idea of neurodevelopment in eating disorders, right? So I'll sort of do a brief review. Um, those who hear me speak before certainly have heard me talk about the different areas involved in eating disorders. And so then certainly as a child psychiatrist who works on both an inpatient, outpatient basis to talk to you about, okay, well, taking these things in mind of normal neurodevelopment, development, how things work, then how do we choose which medications to use? And how we um, how do we look at clinical efficacy while they're used in the patients that we treat? So you know, I think one of the the primary questions is so why neurodevelopment? So you know what we know um, if you look back actually in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual probably until almost the 1970s or so um, maybe up into the 80s there's a sort of belief that like kids were just products of their environment, they were just products of their parenting, and the idea that they have this neurodevelopmental um, issues that cause problems was limited. Um, I think ADHD being the most obvious one sort of comes on the scene, and some ideas about anxiety and mood disorders um, certainly come have come on maybe in the last 30 years or so. So we do know that um, half of all adults had symptoms um, by the age of 14 and three-fourths by their mid-20s. So, you know, most of these symptoms are neurodevelopmental. How are we wired to deal with our environment? Is that ways? Um, my big thing to talk about right now is brain stress resiliency. So how are we born with brains that, that deal with the uh, stressors that life throw at us, whether it's pandemics or anything else that might come our way? Um, and so I think that in looking at these early processes and look at these developmental processes can be important to determine is there other roads we can take, you know, so before things sort of become too hardwired, um, things might be more pliable and might be more changeable. Um, they actually found this along those lines, um, you know, since we're all just fancy mice anyway, um, they found this gene that, you know, works on serotonin, and we'll talk about serotonin today, certainly important for anxiety and mood and eating. Um, and it's a serotonin 1A receptor, and that they found that when it was lacking this, they developed anxiety, nervous behaviors in adulthood, like, you know, they got all stressed out in the maze or whatever. Um, however, if they were able to briefly turn that on in a relatively small window early in life, the anxiety behaviors did not develop. However, if they tried to turn it on later, they still develop to a certain certain extent. So there's this kind of thought of we can recognize things earlier, whether it's through meds or therapy, otherwise, is there ability maybe to um, cause changes that will last into adulthood? So as a result, there is this thing called translational developmental neuroscience. And this is the, you know, through child psychiatry and those kinds of things. So it's interdisciplinary, like basic neuroscience. Um, you know, 
informatics, neurogenetics, bio, cellular biology, physiology, um, you know, psychiatry, neurology, all these kinds of things together to see sort of how do these puzzle pieces come together? How does environment and brain development come together to form what becomes a more static adult, you know, um, where there are certainly those changes that happen along the way. Certainly one way that Laureate's part of that is we are one of the few non-for-profit hospitals that's part of the ABCD um, trial where we're looking at 10-year-olds and we're looking at brain development and changes and um, over time to see and to add to this sort of course of information. So what's how, how, what do we know sort of in some broad strokes around neurodevelopment? So initially, um, you know, first six years of life is just rapid, rapid brain growth, um, where there's overproduction of synapses, um, you know, that, that sort of happen so that actually gray matter or the, the peak of gray matter happens by age 10, with I think a majority happening um, up to age six. And, and this starts to make sense as we look at meds, right? So I'm much more cautious with meds under the age of five and six. Um, you see much more side effects with meds when, when that, that brain is less developed and younger. Um, and then by age 10 or 12, the brain starts to tolerate a lot more meds a lot more often. Um, gray matter hits that peak and then, and actually, you know, lose some um, throughout adolescence and adulthood. And as that sort of gray matter comes down, what we see is an increasing myelination of white matter. It's sort of like, you know, the brain is there and then these sort of like connections happen. I mean, I think that's what you'd say would happen during, you know, becoming an adolescent and adult. You learn to connect emotions with control of emotions, um, learn to connect processes together, abstract concepts, how they fit in your daily life, those kinds of things. Um, that's also important because, you know, white matter is mostly fat, right? And so certainly when you're having this right at, around puberty, especially, um, and then should a young man or woman get an eating disorder at that time, how that might affect brain development or these sort of connections are, is very important. We talk a lot sometimes if patients have had eating disorder since they're young, that they're sort of developmentally stuck at that age because they may be both from a development of just having normal brain growth, but even maybe some uh, at a cellular level, their, their brain growth might get stunted. Um, so again, when we look generally at the brain um, and you just look at it, think of if you've had a kiddo that, that, that you've had as a son or daughter, a niece or somebody that's grown up. I mean, it's all about sensory stuff, right? Everything's in your mouth. You're learning how things work, motor stuff, learning to walk, crawl. That tends to be all the early things. Um, and then higher level, you know, prefrontal is organization, being able to organize and remember things. Limbic cortices is emotional behaviors and learning emotions and how to connect those two. And it's the connection, I think, of these higher cortices with sensory stuff, this integration that happens that gives us an adult brain that's capable of taking care of ourselves and solving problems. Now, printing and synaptic elimination of static spines happens through the third decade. So all the way up into the early 30s, especially prefrontal lobe development um, is, is really important and important for our patients in that prefrontal development, lets them see bigger pictures and hopefully take care of anxiety and eating issues a little bit better when they can see a bigger picture. Um, emotional regulation is obviously in, in both eating disorders and psychiatry, something that's very important, right? So it's this connection of um, what would be limbic processes, especially amygdala, um, you know, um, you know, processes of the insula and other kinds of things, and how they how they connect with the the front of the brain, the brakes that lets you see the big picture and decide to to make decisions. So we know amygdala volume increases between seven and the age of eighteen, and the connectivity with this prefrontal lobe of our emotions and how we react to our emotions. Um, you know, eventually leads to this top-down control of emotions, right? A toddler just reacts to their emotions at the time, um, where I think as adults, we still have the emotions, but instantly that frontal lobe kicks in and decides, this is an appropriate place to display emotions. How do I display emotions? How then might they impact other people? That's especially, you know, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex controlling and doing those things in therapy. That's what we're learning to do. We're learning to take these more advanced part of our brains and see if they can, um, you know, 
downregulate the more kind of primitive, emotionally reactive parts of our brains that can be brought up by anxiety, brought up by malnutrition, brought up by trauma, certainly all those things. So, you know, the three systems is prefrontal cortex, regulatory control, you know, and this is the ability of why teenagers do stupid crap, why you can't rent a car until you're 26, you know, that you're going to have some ability to, to think before you act. Um, you know, the striatum is really, you know, ventral and dorsal striatum are involved in reward, right? So approach and, um, approach and retract, right? So if you have very strong reward systems, as we see in bulimia, then approaching and wanting to do reward sometimes gets you, you know, to feel better to the point of getting trouble. Um, most time in anorexia, they have down-regulated striatum and reward systems um, and up-regulated punishment systems. And so then their behaviors become more regulated by avoiding things that make them feel bad instead of chasing things that make them feel good. Um, and so, you know, that amygdala and how it works with the striatum is involved in that um, avoidance, that anorexics, everything is conceived as a threat and, and then their primary mechanism is to avoid. Um, so evolutionarily wise, you know, I, I think, you know, if you look at primates and those kinds of things, it sort of makes sense in some ways that um, when you have hierarchical um, living where there tends to be advanced males and those kinds of things that tend to have control over females, that if you're a young male or, or, or young, you know, um, animal in general, then that ability to sort of be impulsive and go chase after things could actually lead you to take some risks and determine new territory, new other kinds of things, that that risk taking early on makes some sense. In human characteristics, I think understanding where your boundaries are and experiencing life gives us a better idea of who we are, what we like, what motivates us. And so being able to, to do some risks and not be so tightly regulated probably allows for some life experience and some, some, um, some things that can be helpful for us later on. Um, and mechanism in the eating disorder, it's, it's obviously, you know, I've already sort of talked about that. It's, 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 it's reward and anxiety and stress, and then how our brains either, you know, temper that or don't, and how that sometimes leads to different behaviors. Um, you know, so the ways that we would see that genetically driven, um, you know, this is a slide that I use a lot, is that when we look at the genetics of what somebody looks like that has anorexia, that what kinds of wiring they have before they ever got sick, you know, it's negative emotionality, low self-esteem, esteem, which really drives their body image and really drives their anxiety, sense of perfectionism. And when they get anxious, they are harm avoidant, right? When they get anxious, they tend to try to make themselves feel better by avoiding any possible thing that might make them feel bad. Um, obviously, if that becomes lack of belief in themselves and body image, then avoiding food um, gains them some sort of control and makes them feel better for short periods of time. Um, they tend to be more inhibited. They tend to have picky eating, probably going back to reward systems, right? That And it makes it easier for them to go without food if food does not provide a lot of reward from them. Their interceptive awareness, their ability to understand their stomach, we know that, um, especially in anorexia, they tend to have an anxiety. I see in a lot of my patients that gets, because they don't recognize it very well, they have a lot of alexithymia or a lack of, and it gets displayed in their body. So lots of stomach aches, GI, somatic issues, headaches, those kinds of things, basically leading to that belief of why we do therapy. Like if you can recognize and deal with your emotions, they're less likely to come out in your body, maybe less likely to come out in eating disorder symptoms. Um, a lot of obsessive consultative personality traits or symmetry, again, I think an anxiety, keeping life very organized and very simple. But so lots of reward dependence. So a lot of our anorexic patients think that um, getting in the right college, doing the right thing, making straight A's will make them feel happy, but they run into low reward activity. It tends not to really end up paying off for them. However, if they do anything that is overwhelming for them or that gets them in trouble, that punishment is extra sensitive and probably leads to furthering on their behaviors. Um, where what we see in bulimia is still negative emotionality, low self-esteem, and these patients sometimes socially and otherwise are more capable than their anorexic colleagues. And, and recognizing too, there's a large swath of patients that will go back and forth between these diagnoses. Tend to be anxious and fearful, also has some obsessive compulsive personality trait. Um, but they tend to, I think when they experience anxiety, experience more impulsive, 
ability to want to feel better right away. So they have high reward reactivity, which ends up causing their mood to be really dysregulated, probably due to lack of connection to their frontal lobe too, especially as they're younger. I think we see in this patient population as they get in their 30s and 40s, as that brain development, should they be properly nourished and, and, and over time go well, that they're able to you know, do a better job of regulation. I mean, the same reason from an extreme set, like, you know, if a toddler doesn't get something in the store, they can cry and have a tantrum. Um, you know, I, I think maybe I, I get close in Bass Pro Shop if that doesn't work, but I probably will, you know, temper my reactions if, if something happens, um, you know, as we get older, even probably as soon as being in your, you know, eight to 10 to 12 to 14, they might certainly roll their eyes and look angry, but they're not gonna embarrass themselves. They'll think about the greater reaction. And that continues to grow in, in some levels as we get up into our 20s and 30s. Again, they tend to, have, however, generally have this impulsive lack of frontal lobe regulation, like how, I, how do I feel good as soon as possible? Um, and I think that's some of the reason it leads to affective dysregulation. They get themselves in trouble, still have poor self-esteem, and end up on this roller coaster of chasing their behaviors and then chasing the reactions to their behaviors as well. So the sad thing is, um, you know, one of the queens of um, modern neuroscience and development, and as long as most other things, Janet Treasure, um, this is an article actually, it's sadly enough, I think it was done in the 1990s um, or early 2000s, when I looked to do this presentation on like, oh, let's get a good neurodevelopmental model of anorexia. What do we think is happening early on with frontal lobe mechanisms and with what's happening? And there wasn't a lot. Um, so I've kind of taken the paper down to, to some simpler elements. So first at birth, kids gotta be wired a certain way, right? So when we know that probably 95% of people are not wired to develop sustained uh, difficult eating disorders, Certainly, if you have anxiety, you might be sustaining some self-esteem or dieting or exercise behaviors, but maybe not to the point of being, um, you know, symptomatic and problem in day-to-day -day life. In early childhood, again, because of the wiring, anxious, insecure attachments can tend to be dismissive, um, causes problem with self-reflection, identifying the emotions, which is alexithymia, impairment in emotional processing, leading to a sort of form of rigidity that life has to be that way. I'm not good at looking at my emotions. And so unless things work out a specific way, I get upset or overwhelmed, leading to perfectionism and stuff, which is great for school and great for getting your grades and goes in school. Not so good with emotional regulations when things don't go your way or, or someone's in relationships as well. So we know that they have heightened you know, corticotropin releasing hormone activity, um, hypercholesterol, you know, cortisolemia, meaning that their cortisol levels, their level of alertness, their level of the amygdala going off when something bad might happen because of the punishment sensitivity, they'll tend to get these surges of stress hormones, which then certainly have effects on the brain as well. They tend to have serotonergic overactivity. We know, especially in the limbic areas of the brain, reduced amygdala and hippocampal volume. So they, they, they tend to have these, these things where their stress response is, is, is exaggerated, maybe recognizes this also would put them at higher risk of PTSD. Um, in the little, you know, arrow, if you can see this on this, this um, oval on the side, what does corticotropin releasing hormone do when it is upregulated? Um, decreases sexual thoughts, decreased heart rate and blood pressure, slows, causes gastroparesis, um, decreased social interaction, exploration, decreased appetite, decreased pain. And we actually have studies to show that anorexics have decreased pain sensitivities and increased anxiety. These are things that we see in our anorexic patients all the time. Um, things that are further hampered if they have nutritional problems on top of that. Um, you know, so you can sort of kind of see how these things, whether chicken and egg, how, how they happen and, and make things difficult for patients. So then you take puberty into that. So you take already this sort of rigid, you know, lack of um, um, reward, avoidant, anxious, stomach-oriented patient, and then you just throw hormones. In women, I'll say that this neurodevelopmental model was made for women. Um, the estrogen effects on serotonin and HPA, right? So most of my practice over the age of 12 are, are, are young women under the age of 12 are boys. 
So, you know, it starts to become, you know, emotional regulation issues and, and problems that happen. Depression and anxiety certainly can get worse at this time. Certainly the reason why if those are driven, that it'll drive these avoidant behaviors, especially around around food and eating, and certainly a reason why we see, you know, anorexia nervosa and bulimia acutely worsening in the pubertal time. Again, a pubertal time where it's sort of worsening all these strong things without a really good developed frontal lobe to sort of, you know, put on the brakes and make some alternative decisions to respond to therapy as well. And then over time, there becomes this, um, you know, this positive or negative feedback loop, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, you know, stress leads to worse HPA, which leads to, you know, more problems, you know, um, with how the brain responds and less exploration and increased anxiety. Um, and so it makes a, a higher sensitivity in the environment, which can certainly lead to, to more issues over time. So I always describe this as the world's worst slide, um, which of course then I have to put in my presentation, only because you know I think anytime you hear somebody talk about neurobiology, impacts of body and um, microbiomes uh, and all kinds of things, leptin, ghrelin, you know all these things that act together, a lot of times people will get really concentrated on okay, people with anorexia have this hormone change. Um, you know, and you know, we're talking about let's say even corticotropin releasing a hormone. Um, you know, we're talking about a relationship with cortisol, but a relationship that extends out of how integrated all these systems are. How a problem in one system can lead to other systems, and then as we start not eating right or eating properly, how those further impact those systems over time. So this was actually a a, a, a neurodevelopmental endocrine overview of what people thought that they saw in eating disorders and eating. Um, so again, I, I think we just got to keep in mind that this is extraordinarily complicated that, you know, I think the days of um, coming up both whether it's imaging or whether it's models like this of, of really super complex um, computer algorithms as far as um, AI and those kinds of things. I think this is where we start to make a difference where you could put this giant thing into AI and then you can start to see how changes in one system might lead to changes in another. And then as we're, we're looking very simply to change those systems, um, what might create you know, positive versus negative outcomes as far as sort of eating and stress management, et cetera. So I always go through this. So the cycle always we'll look at is we have these traits. These traits are really hard to change, right? Unfortunately, self-esteem, anxiety, those kinds of things tend to be, in a lot of my patients, lifelong traits with anorexia and bulimia. But you know, then those traits are are still affected by the environment, um, which is both internal and external things sort of influence that, and then can create an illness or not. You know, which is sort of the quicksand is the weather in this case. You know, and, and how things work when everything's combined. Um, and that's the state-dependent stuff that's also affected by malnutrition or um, excessive eating and binging and purging or, you know, drug use or other kinds of things that sometimes can happen in bulimia. So to remember how all these things sort of work in eating disorders is important because then when you layer on, okay, now are we talking about this in a 14-year-old or a 21-year-old or a 34-year-old, then that neurodevelopment is, is, again, another layer on top of that. What does their frontal lobe look like? How can they really respond? If I'm dealing with 13 or 14 year old Madison program versus an 18 year old, 17, 18 year old Madison program, you know, how much their brains can really handle and do even if nourished. And then how much do I need parents to fill in that gap versus look towards autonomy in college? Like these are still neurodevelopmental processes that are important for how nourished they are, how developed individually their frontal lobe and their ability to do the impulses are. That all goes into a complex decision making to try to decide what follow up and what they're capable of doing even when it comes to, to college and, and job and those kinds of things. So, you know, at the end of the day, as a psychiatrist, um, you know, probably the simplest part of my job that is still complex is, um, you know, as a child psychiatrist, I'm trying to figure out, you know, can medicines be part of changing this giant equation to make a more stress resilient brain that's more capable of, of eating and, and, and existing in life? Um, 
you know, so just, you know, so there's also, you know, there's this idea of pharmacokinetics, right? So this is just the availability of how does the body process the drug. So not even talking about how very different the neural systems are in a five versus a 10 versus a 15 year old, but just what happens to, if you give the same drug to an adult or, or child, you know, child, children are not just many adults. How do they, how do they react? And so in pharmacokinetics, what we know is because they're smaller, as you'd expect, this is the, the one, I think this is the common sense of one of what most people think, which is they're smaller, they weigh half of what I do, they should give them half the dose of meds. I, I wish it was that easier. Now we can see in, in fluoxetine that, yeah, that truth, fluoxetine also happens to have the ability to have a very long half-life, so elimination stuff is not an important for it. But what they saw is higher plasma levels in children than in adults, so you might need to keep that in mind with meds that last a long time, that the liver and kidney is not getting rid of, and then their body mass can become very important. Now, for most drugs for me, what I'm surprised by, um, as we'll talk about, especially liver and kidney stuff, is that because they generally tend to eliminate meds quicker and better than me than, than we do in adults, I'm surprised that usually like dosing doesn't look super different, you know, between adolescents and adults. So one example is liver, right? So their livers, compared to the rest of their mass are a more substantial part and they'll actually get rid of a drug. In this case, this is talking about um, bupropion, which is Wellbutrin. Um, and basically so that in, you know, a, in, a, in a kid that gets rid of the drug in 12 hours, what takes 21 hours in adults, right? Where this can be complicated too, is then trying to decide, well, do you need constant drug levels to get effect? Should I give a medicine like a Zoloft, which gets rid of quickly twice a day? But then if I take it twice a day, are they more likely to like not take it or miss it and not be compliant? So these are these are harder questions that we don't have great studies to look at. But they, their liver tends to get rid of things a little more, a little more quickly. Um, the other thing is they don't have as much body fat, and certainly our patients generally if you're anorexic, but even worse. And so they, the, the drug can't sort of, sometimes drugs build up in the body fat to get released and have better blood levels. So again, exposure, you know, we don't have any studies to say that you have to constant Zoloft to, to, to create anxiety relief, but you know, they're, they're getting rid of the drug faster. So you sometimes have to watch for withdrawal syndromes can be worse in kids. Last is kidneys too. Their kidneys just work better than ours. Um, and can get rid of things shorter. Lithium, which is obviously very important, leak mostly got rid of by the kidneys. Um, you know, the half-life is you know, 18 hours in kids and 22 hours in adults, so especially something like lithium where there's toxicity levels, you gotta be watching and careful. And obviously in our patient population, make sure that they're hydrated and those kinds of things so the kidneys can work as well. So these things are important as we're are looking at it. Um, it is certainly the, the reason it's important for me um, getting my MD and being a medical doctor and coming through all those, you know, those classes I, I took. Um, and I think the importance in, you know, in child psychiatrists, I mean, in, in somebody who specifically study these meds and can understand how they're different in a seven-year-old, a 14-year-old and a 20-year-old can be important. Uh, one of the reasons that Laureate where comorbid symptoms of depression and anxiety, knowing how this interacts both with their eating and developmentally, I think it's important to be a child psychiatrist to make those decisions. Um, what else do we know? So the other is pharmacodynamics, and that's what, that's by like receptor binding. So once you have a certain dose that's not changed by the liver and other kinds of things, then like why you know sometimes adults and children don't react the same way. So you know dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, these receptors change a lot during development. So that drugs that work well in adults don't always work well in kids. Some drugs that work well in kids maybe not don't work as well in adults. Um, limited studies, but here's some stuff we know from studies. So the euphoric stuff that you get from caffeine stimulants, obviously stimulants run from caffeine all the way to meth and cocaine with Ritalin being certainly hopefully closer to um, caffeine along that, that line of things. But in adults, obviously this can be abusing and cause euphoria and make them feel good. That's less likely in children, right? So the worry about stimulants for ADHD causing euphoria is, is reduced. Um, we know that in a lot of studies that the metabolic effects, you know, weight gain, lipid changes, especially Abilify is a great example of this, where there's actually more likely to be weight gain in adolescents. Um, and for me and my population, it's always trying to find out, like, 
someone has bipolar disorder, if they have resistant depression, when am I using meds that can affect hunger and carbohydrate cravings and weight? When I'm also trying to regulate getting somebody to trust meds, making sure they're at the proper weight, making sure I'm not inducing weight gain and causing them to have a relapse or them just reading the, you know, the blogs of, of worries about weight gain. Um, and Abilify is a good example because I see a lot of my colleagues out there using a lot of atypicals in Abilify, especially on the inpatient um, setting, because a lot of times when their brains aren't, aren't really nourished, I don't know why, but I would say from a clinical standpoint of doing this for 20 years, I, I certainly see that sometimes these medications can be good in the short term of helping with affective dysregulation, anxiety, anger, where some other medications don't work. The question of how long you use it is still necessary afterwards. A lot of times the weight gain and carbohydrate craving stuff doesn't kick in until leptin levels are closer to normal, which is usually right, right at menstrual threshold. So when sometimes patients are leaving the inpatient side, so and then they will get this big changes in, in appetite and in weight gain. So those things are really important to consider when you're passing off care and somebody else is inheriting it, trying to determine if we're using these medications on a short, medium, or long-term basis. Um, we know that really young kids, so are less tolerant, less tolerate stimulants. So I know that if I give a five-year-old Ritalin, there's about a 50% chance they'll have a side effect. If I give a 10-year-old Ritalin, there's about a 15% chance that they'll have a side effect. So there seems to be some differences in brain development and how it works. So sometimes medications that haven't worked when they're young can still work when they get older if the brain changes in a positive way, at least concerning that medicine. Um, hepatotoxicity, right? So we, we've we got a monitored liver and obviously white blood cells and other kinds of things with valproic acid, which is Depakote. Um, higher toxicity sometimes in younger kids. Um, we know especially, um, you know, I'm, there's some reasonable data with lamotrigine that it might be helpful for not only bipolar depression, but unipolar depression. It certainly has less you know, hunger and other side effects, but it does have this propensity to rash, which sometimes can progress on to Stevens-Johnson syndrome. We know that it, children are at higher risks, and so we've got to be more careful with that in kids and sort of titrate more slowly and, and be, be careful watching for that. Um, obviously, the biggest example probably in the last 20 years has to do with SSRIs and suicidalities in young kids. And what I would say is not just adolescents. We think this probably extends up into the early 20s. And so Basically, this FDA you know, review, um, there is about you know, 4% of those taking SSRIs experience suicidal thinking and behavior. And this is a true effect. So I don't want to say that somebody who prescribes these meds and people that have done these studies to say this is really overblown. It's not true. There seems to be something. And, and for me, I see it early in the process. So remember, with these medications, you change serotonin right away. And then the anti-anxiety, the stress resiliency factor takes time, sometimes six, eight, 12 weeks. And for me, it's because you change that serotonin, but the reaction that gets you actually more brain stress resiliency is how the brain reacts to that change in the weather, change in serotonin. Now, the acute serotonin change in a small percentage of kids makes them nuts, makes them irritable and not feel good. They have a tendency towards suicide, they'll get there. I haven't seen in my practice a kid who's never been suicidal all of a sudden get a medicine and become suicidal. But if they have a propensity towards self-harm and suicidality and you give them medicine that makes them feel worse, that can happen. And it usually happens right when you change that serotonin, which is within 24 hours of taking the dose um, and less likely to happen. You know, parents always grab onto medicines in positive and negative ways. For me, it would be pretty rare that someone's on a medicine for two months and then all of a sudden to develop suicidality. I think it's really an early serotonergic process that happens. So this study was true. And so the FDA looked at it. And so in 2004, there's a black box warning, right? And basically, pediatricians, you know, there is only about one-tenth of the need of child psychiatrists across the nation. The average waiting list in the United States for a child psychiatrist is three months, right? So there's just not enough of us around to take care of everybody who needs meds. So nurse practitioners, you know, um, pediatricians, other people were doing a lot of SSRI use. When they saw this, I think without the training or other kinds of things specifically, they really backed off from use, right? Um, and so the interesting thing that happened, right, is I think this is a true effect. You got to watch, you got to watch those first few weeks, you got to stop the medicine if it happens, make sure you're keeping patients safe. There is studies showing if you combine it with CBT, you actually sort of uh, 
mitigate out that suicide risk. But basically, there was a steady increase in serotonin and SSRI use, and there was a, a year by year dip in, in childhood suicidality rates. And then when the black box warning, there was actually a jump in suicidality rates. So it's always that, yes, there can be this side effect, but the side effect of untreated depression and severe anxiety is suicidality, maybe even greater risk than the smaller risk of starting a medicine and watching them carefully. So, you know, and there is the Lexapro study, which actually showed, seemed to show s or Lexapro less of this irritability or suicidality effect. So again, it, it, it's about, there's something different in these brains and how they react to serotonin. Um, and you just, you gotta watch the side effects. It's a real side effect, but remember, I mean, this is why I tell my parents so much, especially those ones that are really worried about meds. I'm pretty conservative in how I do meds, but telling them, you know, untreated depression, anxiety, eating disorders, they can have awful consequences, right? So suicide and, and you know, life experience and how it affects school and relationships are, are very real and can be very sustained. And so always balancing out benefits and side effects is important. Starting meds, watching them carefully. I'm seeing almost all my young patients back within a matter of just a few weeks and telling them, you know, contact me in this first week if something gets, I always say if there's something more than mild that happens, just stop it and let me know. If you stop it, the effects should go away. They don't just make somebody suicidal and once the medicine's there, it, it'll it'll go away unless that medicine is irritating them and, and it's on board. So what else do we see developmentally? So ADHD is something that we certainly see common, especially before the age of 12, you know, especially the reason why most of my practice under age 12 is boys. Um, so it's certainly a neurodevelopmental disorder that has to do with frontal lobe development, right? And um, this default, this basically this, um, our frontal lobe's ability to make a stop and think is and calm down and not move so much is is you know is not working in this population. It's interesting to see you know development happens from simple sensory even in the womb simple sensory stuff then some limbic stuff and then frontal lobe stuff is last probably representing evolution um, and then you know they're also those systems continue to grow in that level until we get to our thirties. So an interesting thing is that in preemies, you know, we know there are studies in really, really young kids, if they're like less than, you know, delivered, especially at less than, you know, 32 weeks, definitely less than 30 weeks, that their rates of ADHD are like two, three times the general population, I think, because that frontal lobe is like the last thing to cook, it's the last thing to develop, and if they don't have that important uterine development and they're delivered early, there can be higher risks. So again, development both in the womb, outside of the womb, continuing is, is makes sense. And what do stimulants and Ritalin do is really this default mode, um, you know, that kind of makes them act before they think. It sort of down-regulates that, that leads them to be calmer um, and leads them to be able to have less attentional lapses. And then also too, with my younger kids, especially if they have anxiety or emotional issues, there's always that issue, and I see this in a lot of my um, eating disorder patients, of trying to determine if you have somebody with brain stress resiliency and anxiety issues, and possibly impulsivity and ADHD issues, of which one's which, right? These emotional issues I'm treating with SSRIs, therapy, exposure and response prevention. ADHD is really a medicine thing. It is really a Ritalin stimulant thing like a lot of the therapies and stuff really don't, they're not gonna calm your kid down and make them be able to sit down and do their math work. Stimulants for ADHD symptoms can make anxiety bigger and worse, right? So always looking at this balance, especially in young females, right? So ADD is so fast, grades aren't good, you want to get their grades better. Anybody concentrates better on a stimulant. And so you sort of, you know, if anxiety is making that brain harder to concentrate, if you, you know, hold up that frontal lobe, they'll still be able to concentrate better, but is it getting to the primary problem? And so this is one thing I see in my practice, eating disorders, not eating disorders, is trying to determine how much emotion, how much breaks are involved. Um, my eldest kid is 15, he has both. And so understanding sometimes needing treatment for both of those can be important as well. And getting that accurate diagnosis and seeing how they respond to meds, making sure if you put somebody on a stimulant who's having concentration problems at school, that the concentration problems are because they're worried about their body image all day, 
and then you give them a stimulant, you could make them more anxious and then not eat and could make their eating disorder worse if you don't have the correct diagnosis. Um, we also use atomoxine or um, um, Stratera, um, which works on norepinephrine, where these other medications are really working on the dopamine circuit. Um, and it tends to work and can help partially with anxiety. And so it's another mechanism for trying to help that frontal lobe work better. Um, guanafenacin, clonidine, these are also in, you know, intuitive and those kinds of things. These are alpha-2 agonists. Uh, this can help with sleep. It can certainly help with just sort of down-regulating some of the over-regulated nature of them. And again, I've already talked about eating sort of stuff. For me, it's always making sure that we're not, the concentration problems aren't due to depression and anxiety. And then it's looking at, is this person using a stimulant to suppress appetite? Is it going to make their anxiety worse? How do we balance that out? It's not uncommon that sometimes I'll try some stratera in my patients who are acutely recovering. If it works, great, because then it works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where stimulants really work like Tylenol. They work while they're in your system for a matter of hours. Um, and then if they're well enough and it's not working and it's clearly their anxiety stuff's better and it's clearly ADHD stuff, then I think using stimulants carefully as long as they're eating can certainly be okay. But again, imagine this. So if you have a patient who's in the hospital, recovering from anorexia, they've been diagnosed with all kinds of stuff, and they're on, you know, Abilify or Risperdal or Zyprexa, which increases their appetite, or Depakote, which causes carbohydrate cravings, and then they're on a stimulant, which suppresses their appetite, um, and, and then you're trying to get them out there. You're trying to teach them intuitive eating to understand their meal plan and trust their meal plan and listen to their body signals. Those things can create complications. Not treating the depression and anxiety certainly creates complications. So you, having a team approach, having somebody who's capable in understanding development, eating disorders, and neurobiology is important before making complicated decisions around medications. What else do we see developmentally, right? So, you know, first of all, all depression is not the same in teenagers, right? So um, our patients sometimes don't recognize their anxiety and depression, a lot of um, lexithymia, but then Instead of being you know, sad and tearful and those kinds of things, a lot of teenagers tend to have more irritability, more lack of interest in things, more somatic symptoms, headaches and stomach aches, and then decline in function, like all of a sudden grades or activities um, going downhill. Um, and what we know in teens is like Prozac or Fluoxetine, Sertraline or Zoloft or Escitalopram or Lexapro probably have the most data and they have FDA recommendations in teenagers. When they did the TAD study, which is a teenage depression study, fluoxetine, 69% response, CBT, 65% response, combination, 85% response. And this is important too, right? Some people don't want to take any meds regardless, and it's like, well, you're possibly limiting your response if you have moderate depression or anxiety. Some people just want to take meds, and therapy is too hard or too expensive, too many copays. Again, now you're talking about 69% response, so that combination is important. Um, you know, what's interesting about teens and not being like adults is that in adults, um, and I deal with a lot of severe depression, resistant refractory depression here together with eating disorders, is that in adults, the kind of course of events is try SSRI, they have the least amount of side effects, especially compared to the old medicines in the 70s and 80s. And then if that doesn't work, since it just works on serotonin, SSRI stands for serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor, you try SNRI serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So a bigger bomb hitting more neurochemicals. And in adults, that teens, tends to lead to a higher response rate and a higher remission rate, which is the importance I took of medicine that made me feel pretty much almost all the way better, not just half better. And so they did this Tordia study, actually having a Pittsburgh where I trained. And um, when they looked at it, and they, you know, you fail on Prozac, and then they put you either just on another SSRI, or they put you on an SNRI, which would be like Effexor or Venlafaxine or Pristique, which is Ven, you know, Desvenlafaxine, or on Cymbalta, um, they really saw that there wasn't a big difference choosing a second SSRI versus an SNRI, right? Now, here's where it gets really complicated. What we know is these noradrenergic systems seem to develop later, like mid to late teens to early 20s. Um, so no studies, I can say, but I can say in my clinical practice, because you know, it's not uncommon that I get patients who've tried all the SSRIs and they haven't worked and they have really bad depression and we're not wanting to move to big atypicals with side effects. Is that, you know, sometimes, you know, I think there's a distinct difference of a 
11, 12, 13 year old and maybe like a 16, 17, 18 year old. I've had some 16, 17, 18 year olds that can do well on a Prestige or a Cymbalta that, you know, that these, that this, you know, nervous systems are probably different from individual to individual, but as they start to develop, these meds sometimes can provide an advantage, but might be a difference in advantage in a 13 year old versus a 17 year old, certainly versus a 24 year old. Um, and that it's a continual growing process, not an on and off switch. We also know that ADHD, OCD, conduct, PTSD, they all affect response in kids when to meds. A lot of times the eating sores, I have multiple ones of those going on at the same time, as well as malnutrition, like when you're not eating, the meds don't work. So it's super important for eating disorders and looking. So for me, it's always, gosh, I need that brain to be nourished. I need it to be able to use therapy and do things. And then, you know, we're putting the meds on. Sometimes it's not until months later. Sometimes it's not until I try to come off meds because they've been doing so great. And the only thing you're changing is that med. You know, I'm in weight range and doing great. And life's going good. My period's fine. I don't have problems. And then I try to take them off the Prozac or reduce the dose in half because they want to take less meds. And then they're like, oh, wait, that was working. Like, I'm more irritable. And, that was, and then we can always put it back on. Sometimes it's not until, because we're doing so much in the acute treatment phase, it's hard to tell what's working or not, but later on you can see for certain individuals that really provides some brain stress resiliency for them. Um, bipolar disorder. So, you know, my other area of interest, probably in my training and development before I got here to Loria, was in child adolescent bipolar disorder. So what's interesting is you go back to the history of bipolar disorder in the 20s when Kreplin described when they had no meds, he just described these patients and some spontaneously got better and how their episodes looked. It certainly described the process that we see with more manic episodes in the teens and 20s and the more sort of depression and other problems as they get older. But even he back then described that 38% of his patients had onset younger than 20 years and a and, and little less than 1% had onset before 10. Um, now, when I worked at Pittsburgh, so in the 90s, there started to be this idea that even kids could get bipolar, right? They did this study where they saw, again, it was in Dallas and they took like people with adult symptoms and asked about sleep and other kinds of things and we're seeing they had symptoms. And why this is important is there's a process in bipolar disorder called kindling, which means the more episodes of depression or mania you get, the worse the illness gets. You add drug and alcohol or other things which are common, half of people with bipolar have that problem and it just makes it a more tangled mess, a more knot of things. It's more difficult to resolve, whether it's meds or proper sleep or therapy or the, obviously the combination. Um, so we, we, you know, we can kind of see that like if this happens, it can happen in kids. Defining that is still difficult, right? You know, I, I unfortunately in certain settings see a lot of over calling of bipolar disorder. And when the meds are lithium, Depakote, atypical antipsychotics, which especially affect carbohydrate craving and hunger and weight gain. I mean, and in individuals that we have that already have labile moods and those kinds of things, like trying not to muck up the waters by making an improper diagnosis and then putting a medication, which makes hunger and intuitive eating processes is, is an important one. So certainly lithium has been used for a long time. It's the only medication ever seen to reduce suicide. It can be used in bipolar disorder. Kidneys, hydration, those kinds of things are important. Um, Depakote, you could treat childhood bipolar disorder with that as well, and, and, and atypicals. And then there's also studies of, of, unfortunately, sometimes depending on severity of bipolar disorder, sometimes you know, cocktails or mix of drugs are necessary to more completely take care of symptoms where somebody can sleep and go to school, stay out of the hospital, stay safe. And, and eating disorders, again, making sure you have a proper diagnosis, making sure that mood lability making sure that anxiety, which can look like racing thoughts and sleep problems, are not mistaken. Because the problem is, is that, you know, let's take an atypical antipsychotic, like olanzapine has a lot of properties which makes it sedating and anti-anxiety, right? And so you'll put on this medication for somebody's anxiety driving their mood all over the place, and it chills them out and makes them less anxious, and then their mood will be more stable. Well, and then you'll say, well, their mood was you know, bipolar and unstable, and now it's stabilized because I put them on a quote-unquote mood stabilizer. Well, it could have been you just started lanzapine and you treated their anxiety, right? Could have been that you could have put them on, you know, a little bit of Zoloft and over time made sure they're properly eating and doing their therapy and not 
drinking and doing impulsive activity and they could just have just as much relief with much less side effects. So again, to, to not underestimate the importance of a really good and accurate diagnosis, history of how they react to meds, making sure they're properly nourished, that all these elements, just like in that crazy drawing, affect each other and the proper, you know, the possibility, even after 20 years, I'm humbled, you know, in the fact of difficult cases and using psychological testing and getting to watch them in the hospital over time to see how they react. Now the ability that I've had patients who are I treated when they were 12 and they're 26 now to see how these things grow out and develop to watch borderline personality disorder become nothing as they get in their 30s. Neurodevelopment is important. Understanding the layers of those symptoms. How old are they? What other symptoms? How's their nutritional status? Like you start to look at things. Well, you have this problem. You need this medication. Is really a simple and non-scientific approach that that doesn't do the patient any good. Um, anxiety, OCD. So this is certainly huge in eating disorder patients. Um, again, as in depression, puberty, estrogen, girls are two to three more times likely to get anxiety disorders at adolescent. That 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 estrogen hormone really adds an element would make things harder. Anxiety is the most common disorder, right? 15 or 20% of the time. It's also one I think get, that gets missed the most, especially in our population who are lexithymic. And I'll see an anxious perfectionist a girl and I ask them if they're anxious or stressed. And they'll be like, no, not at all. I'm not an anxious person at all. Um, you know, um, OCD is about 1%, but it's much higher in anorexia. So especially in the eating disorder population, we're seeing this a lot. It's the most common thing in, in general when I see kids. And, and I like to make it bigger brain stress resiliency. How does your brain deal with it when it's thrown a curveball? How does life work when you're thrown something that doesn't work? Um, how flexible is your thinking? How ability do you have to think around things? Um, still using SSRIs, duloxetine, um, which is Cymbalta, was also approved in 2014. Um, anxiety in all my patients, but especially kids and especially eating disorder patients, benzos, Ativan, Xanax, clonazepam, more behavioral disinhibition, right? Especially important in your impulsive patients, right? So I'm super anxious and I get impulsive. And when I do, I, you know, I kind of lose it and break something, throw things, do those kinds of things. Common thing people reach for is Ativan, right? You know, chill you out, those kinds of things. Um, but for some of our patients, especially some with, you know, what used to be cluster B or, you know, dis disinhibited borderline traits, um, you know, it's a possibility those medic that medication will actually make it worse, right? It makes you more disinhibited, similar to alcohol, and worse in kids than they are and even in adolescents and young adults. So you got to be careful with that. I have found for my anxiety patients around meals, you know, hydroxyzine, uh, Vistaril, which is sort of almost fancy Benadryl, is just about as effective as benzos with much less side effect and, and disinhibition. So why not use a, a safer, easier thing? Buspirone and Buspar is pretty safe. Right, it's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, I certainly use it a fair amount. It's kind of a pain that you got to use it two or three times a day, so compliance can be an issue. But limited trials in children, but probably doesn't have as much harm as safer than certainly some other meds. And so in eating disorders, A, where's their nutrition? B, you know, how's their anxiety and how am I treating it, you know, over time? And, you know, and this is a huge one, right? Brain stress resiliency, anxiety, and eating disorders are huge, they underlie it, they tend to go past it. And so sometimes using meds to help with that can be helpful for both the medium and long term. Nutrition, right? So I've already described what happens when we're malnourished. Well, you know, no serotonin, right? So we know that food decreases, decreases serotonin synthesis in the brain. You need tryptophan to make serotonin. We know that let's say in women less estrogen, reduced in the star state, modulates serotonin uptake, so it doesn't even take the serotonin up. So what I say is, if you're amenorrheic and you're underweight, you know, A, you don't have a lot of serotonin to work with if you're using Prozac, and B, then it doesn't even get uptaked back into the neurons very well. Um, you know, so you're just sort of missing out on the point of what's creating the change. And so medicines less than 90% of ideal body weight don't work well. So when I go through, if somebody's quote unquote failed medications, the question is, did you take big enough a dose for a long enough period of time at the proper weight, at the proper nutritional status if you're talking about eating disorder patients? Because if they tried something at 75% of ideal body weight 
for three months, even if it's good dose, I can't say that that's still a failed trial. A failed trial means all the situations were correct, they were compliant and took it, and then it caused a side effect or it didn't work. Um, we know CSF concentrations are low, and here's the other thing is, some for so many of our patients, this malnourished state, this low state of, of um, serotonin, which sometimes makes them numb and, and in some ways less anxious, that's maybe some of the reasons why they do it, also can lead to higher risk of suicide, right? So your patients that are the most malnourished are probably at the highest risk of suicide too. So it's it's a lot of things. And then you can't just treat them by throwing on some Zoloft if it's not gonna work correctly. So the process, that's why the process, if you have somebody that's underweight of doing proper nourishment as a baseline foundation is so important because nothing else works until that works. The other is folate. Folate's important to make serotonin network up and dopamine. Even if you're, MTHFR system works right, which in some women it doesn't, it's important to do and supplement if that's not working right. But even if it does work right, if you're malnourished, folate's off, you're also not producing monoamines, like these medicines just don't work well. You're gonna stop producing the chemicals you need for your brain to work or for the medicines to work on. Um, other things that we use, like, you know, again, we're treating comorbidities. My team always jokes with me because I always say, gosh, she's really, is there anything else we can do? And I'm like, there's no anti-anorexia pill. Like, she has really bad body image and anorexia and I don't have that pill. But treating comorbid anxiety, if they're properly nourished, can be very important. Um, you know, topiramate, naltrexone for purging. You know, topiramate, sometimes you gotta watch for side effects with, uh, you know, weight loss and you gotta watch for side effects with cognitive slowing or dulling, word finding difficulties. Now, Trexone is obviously that thought that, and especially in binging and purging behaviors, if there's just like alcohol, there's this endogenous opioid release reward that happens that's opioid in nature. And if you can stop those opioid receptors, they don't get the reward. Maybe they do the behaviors less. For me, these are sort of Hail Marys. Like they're not really sub substantive for a large majority of patients, but in patients with more severe behaviors who have tried lots of things, trials of these medications, if they're carefully monitored, can sometimes result in improvement of symptoms. You know, oftentimes what we know from naltrexone studies in alcoholic alcoholism is that if you're eating correctly, if, unless you're binging and purging, unless you're doing the behaviors and not getting the reward, they don't work as well, right? And we live in such a recovery, not harm reduction, but in a complete sobriety mechanism, those meds don't work well in that mechanism. If you just don't do them at all, you can't not get the reward from them. The meds don't work as well. And then naltrexone studies, they showed in people that continue to drink, they would drink less and they would, you know, have less pass outs and, you know, less severe drinking episodes. But if they were completely sober from an NAA, they didn't result the same reports. So it's always making sure that the mechanism works with whatever system it's in. Prozac, lots of studies in bulimia around reducing binging and purging. Um, you know, Vyvanse and binging disorder, you know, this is working on dopamine. This is a stimulant. We've talked about stimulants and ADHD. I guess if you're impulsive and has some, you know, issues that might help, I still have asked for those in the company and those kinds of things. Prove to me why this is in short-term studies getting in the way of binge eating disorder other than just suppressing appetite, right? So I think that's an important mechanism in how we look at things and how things work over time. Um, so as we look at things, um, here you can see sort of my references. Here's some good articles, additional resources from the internet that we can look at and do. Um, I think, you know, the closing information is that, you know, I love my job. Um, you know, certainly you can sort of handpick how many, you know, child psychiatrists across the country who are doing dedicated daily even sort of work. They're wonderful people because you're dealing with, I always say doing you know, neuro, you know, psychopharm and anorexic or bulimic adolescent is like, you know, data wise, it's like trying to fly, you know, blind in a snowstorm with, you know, no GPS. I mean, there's not a lot of studies to base things on. Um, you've got to make those decisions as far as caution and doing no harm as trying to help people who are really desperate for help. Um, and so, and, and, and I think the understanding of how the development how the neurobiology, how the nutrition, and then specifically how the medicines work and work in those bodies, like taking all those elements and coming up with good pharmacology is, is complicated. 
you know, the last element I'll go over because it's come up a lot for me recently also is now genetic studies, right? And so I think what I'd like to say about those is information is always good. Right now, that's not always paid for by insurance. Uh, most of these genetic studies are really not looking at receptors and the chance that a medicine is going to work or not, right? And to simplify, they'll put them in sort of green, yellow, and red kind of things. I think what's important is they usually tell how med medicine is metabolized, right? It's usually the P450 system in the liver. And if somebody is a super fast metabolizer and you failed on Prozac, it might mean that you just need to use big doses, right? Because they're chunking through it really fast. So it can be important for that. I tend not to use them unless I've had failures. Um, they can certainly predict MTHFR, which is folate metabolism to see if you need Deplin. They can sometimes predict if you're going to have a higher chance of a, ra a rash from things like Lamictal or Depakote. Uh, there's some things, but they are not, they're not taking the place of the complex things of looking at the diagnosis development in the big picture. It's basically your baseline genetics. Most of it's how you process meds. And it's not, if the process of choosing was getting a blood test and saying that Prozac's going to work 90% of the time, you wouldn't need me doing what I do. You'd need me for other things. Not that the information is not important, but that it's not, it doesn't take the place of clinical information. My hour I have is up. Thank you so much for being with me through this. Um, hopefully get hold of um, you know, Lauren or Heather or any of our admissions department. My email is always open, happy to work with colleagues, happy to answer med questions. Even if you decide not to pursue things here for treatment, I think we try to be collegial and um, work together in the Eans order field, which I love. So please um, shoot me an email. If there's questions, please shoot me questions. And, and thank you so much for your time.